Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another EI Live K-12 session for students and educators, a series of the Columbia Climate School. My name is Christina and I'll be facilitating the session today. For those of you unfamiliar with the Columbia Climate School or joining us for the first time, we are a newly established school at Columbia University for transdisciplinary climate research. The school marshals the university's strengths in basic and applied disciplines and expands its resources to understand climate and its impact on society. The Climate School is the first new school at Columbia in over 25 years and incorporates the entire Earth Institute, which includes the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, along with more than 20 other centers and several hundred people who collaborate among many departments at the university. What we are hoping to do with these EI Live K-12 sessions are to introduce you all to our interdisciplinary work through our scientific experts. These biweekly sessions will run throughout the whole semester. And if you would like any more information about the sessions, do not hesitate to contact us. Each week we'll focus on a certain topic and will be directed towards a certain age range. Today's session is coral chemistry and paleohydrology. In this session, we will learn about how Panama coral skeleton Barium concentration and oxygen isotopic ratios can be used to reconstruct near monthly resolve changes in river discharge and hydrology in Panama back to the 18th century. We will then evaluate the implications of the paleohydrology results for understanding El Nino Southern oscillation effects on droughts in Central America. We are joined by Brad Lindsley, a research professor of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. Please use the Q&A box as the chat will be disabled and the session is being recorded. So we'll send participants a link for this recording after it's been complete. And without further ado, Brad, take it away. Thank you, Christina. Can I ask how many people we have participating? Can you... yes, it looks like we have five attendees right now, but Okay, so if you have questions, everyone, um, you can post them as she said. Well, welcome, thanks for coming. I'm Brad Lindsley. I'm a, um, I'm a geochemist and a geologist. I'm gonna be talking about the coral research I've been doing, which is sort of one half of my research and I'm particularly focused on my work in Panama. And we'll, um, this is gonna be a mostly uh, some science, some data and maybe some lab equipment at the end, we'll see if we have time to actually go into the lab. So in front of you is a, a map of Panama. I don't know if anyone's ever been there, but Panama is in, in Central America. Um, it's very tropical. Um, on, the, on the right, if you can see my cursor, we've got the location of the Panama Canal. And a very interesting feature of the canal is that it's they have this huge artificial lake that was built when they made the canal um, to to use water to lift ships and move them through the canal. And the, it turns out that the lifting process and the draining process is all done by gravity feed. There's no pumps. And so the, um, the canal is very susceptible to hydrologic changes. And we've been working with corals over here in the Gulf of Cherokee on the, on the Pacific side of Panama to try to reconstruct drought cyclicity um, in this area, which is very rainy. We're gonna find out um, when the, it's about three, two and a half meters of rain a year. So more than 10 feet of rain a year, which all falls mostly between May and October. It's a very pronounced wet dry cycle. And there's a picture of the canal um, with these large cargo ships going through it. So when there's drought, they have some problems with the canal. They have to sometimes tell shippers to remove cargo from ships coming in because the ships are have draw too much water and they have to reduce the draft of the ships going through. So, which is a big e economic effect. Um, so, a little bit about my research. I've been working um, with corals. Actually, I started working in Panama as a postdoc at Rice University. And then I proceeded to move these all the other sites in these blue dots on this map of December, um, sorry, January rainfall. And I've been to all these places and been at different kinds of projects over the years. Now I'm back working on Panama and a recently funded NSF project. So today I want to give you a little sort of overview of the coral work and how we use corals to reconstruct climate and then talk about some of the, the two tracers will be how we measure them and how we use the tracers and it's work in progress at the end. Um, sort of a draft conclusion. 
So this coral in front of you is a uh, Prides lutea colony from Tonga. It's about a meter and a half high. They grow about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half a year. So this coral I'm guessing is about 100 to 120 years old. If you ever seen these on snorkel, here's a snorkeler for, for whoop, snorkel, uh, diver, swimmer for a uh, scale. So corals like this, though, are only alive on the outer edge. It's like a skin that's about a centimeter thick. And underneath that is this bone skeleton. Um, this one we didn't sample, but sometimes we do sample them with a drill. We drill down the middle, we take a core out, and then we plug the hole and the, facilitate healing over the, over the top of the coral. I was showing you some of that, um, how, why we do that and why that's so interesting. And we can actually get, what I'm saying, near monthly resolved climate records out of corals like this because they grow about a centimeter a year and they have annual rings in them, many of them do, like trees. So here's an example of a coral from Tonga, um, which is, a, this is an X-ray positive image. And you can see the light and dark alterations of uh, low density skeleton and high density skeleton. And on here, I've drawn on in red marker where the base of the years are. So this one was collected um, in 2004, and it goes back to 1992. And this is the actual picture of the coral here on the whoop, picture of the coral on the right, and how we sample it with a little drill. We drill every millimeter. Um, much uh, the little tiny handheld drills we use. Uh, I show also some pictures in a, in a little bit. And some of these corals, um, this one is from American Samoa, actually was collected in 2011. It goes back to 1521 at the bottom. And this blue line maps out the sample path. And you can clearly see the alternations, light and dark density bands in, in this, this coral. So if we're careful and the coral is continuous, um, we can get continuous records that go back several hundred years. Now, this is really important for me as a climate scientist, because the instrumental data from sort of satellites and ship measurements is only good really in the second half of the 20th century. And before that, it gets very sketchy and spotty. And so we're trying to use corals like these to extend the instrumental record back um, several hundred years before the time that humans really start impacting climate. So, so we sort of get a, so we'd like to know what the climate variability was like before um, our, activities on earth started to impact global climate. So corals are, uh, and again, I apologize, I'm not a biologist, I'm really a geochemist and a geologist, but corals are a symbiotic relationship between a coral animal, the polyp, and zooxanthellae, or these al symbiotic algae that live with the coral animal. And this is a picture of a, a schematic of a coral, and they live on top of the coral surface, and you may, if you go out there during the day and rub your hand on a coral, you might actually get cut because it's really sharp. You can see these sharp edges. And that's because during the day, the corals have the ability to pull their tissue back inside the skeleton and they come out at night to feed and they come out at, during the day to, to photosynthesize sometimes. But a lot of the skeleton is very porous and they're growing, um, secreting carbon carbonate, which is this calcium carbonate material. Um, it's actually mineral aragonite, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that on the bottom of a coral. So it's a symbiotic relationship between a coral, uh, coral animal and a plant. And without the algae, um, which is this pigmented greenish tannish color, they would look white because the tissue itself is translucent. So when you hear a coral bleaches, you may have heard of coral bleaching. That means they've gotten rid of their algae when the water temperature has gotten too warm and all and the, what's there is the translucent tissue, and you can see the white skeleton underneath it. So it looks like they're bleached. And they're actually still alive, and they'll live that way for several months, and they'll sometimes recolonize new strains of algae. And it, but if they don't do that, they can actually die because they need the algae to metabolize properly in a healthy way. This is a digital uh, microscope image at the top of one of these corals. You can see that these, I drew these hexagonal shapes on um, for the, where the polyp would have been living. And you can, this is where they've been, this is the most recent carbonate that was secreted. And this brownish material is actually dried tissue. It's flaky. So the, coral, the, polyp, the corals are very porous um, and there's a lot of porosity and a lot of um, open pore space. So one of the things we're very worried about when we make these geochemical reconstructions is if there's any secondary material that gets deposited in these pore spaces. So we spend a lot of time 
cleaning them and looking to make sure the corals we sample are actually pristine. So I'm going to show you um, how we collect the coral sample. I'm using this example from American Samoa, where I went in November 2011. This is actually Tawu. Um, in the eastern side of this island is now one of the newest national parks in the US, actually. Um, and around the western side, there are some large coral colonies that we got permission with permits and so forth to, to sample. And actually, you wouldn't believe it, but the biggest coral I've ever seen is right under this yellow arrow in about 30 feet of water, not very far offshore from Tawu and American Samoa. And we use, um, this is what the coral looks like. Um, this is the top of the coral, the two divers for scale. And you can see that oftentimes there's a central stalk, like a mushroom that holds up the coral. But this one actually is so large, it's sitting on the bottom and there's a cave underneath it. It's about um, 500 years old, actually dates back to the oldest, the bottom of the coral goes back to 1521. And we use, this case, we used a pontoon um, work boat with two engines. And we, you can see this yellow, this orange hose and black hose is our hydraulic, part of our hydraulic drill system run by this motor up here on the surface. It's a, just a gasoline engine hooked up to a hydraulic um, motor and a hydraulic reservoir. And um, I have a picture of the drill head here. So we've got the bottom underneath, we have divers. We work in teams of two or three. The hydraulic fluid comes down this orange hose or runs through the hydraulic motor, which is right here, and then back out the other side. And it spins this drill bit. And then we use the black hose as simply water being pumped down from the surface to flush um, drill cuttings out of the hole. And we'll, we'll screw on our drill bits and drill rods onto the end of this um, drill shaft and we hold on to it here. These are my colleagues. Um, actually, this is the picture that's uh, right behind me. <laughs> I took this picture. Um, we're joining the top of the coral. Um, so you can see here we're um, using these different types of tools to drill holes and we're um, this work is very slow going. You know, we will spend, in this case, we spent um, six full work days working on this one coral. We come back because we can only die for so long each day and we're very careful not to damage the coral. Um, if you look closely, these little white marks on top of the coral actually are not, not damage we've done. Those are fish bites from parrot and puffer fish that come down and eat the coral, um, take a bite, spit out the skeleton and eat the tissue. Sorry about that. Um, here's a section of, of core. Sorry. My phone was ringing, sorry. Um, this is a section of core that comes out of the hole. Um, we're very, um, hang on a second, sorry. I'm giving this seminar, can I call you back? Sorry. <laughs> um, and so this is a, a we drill, um, the, the bit is hollow and we drill, uh, so we drill, drill down about 80 centimeters and we have to snap out the piece of core. We, so we use this little device here, which has a tooth on it to snap out the core. And we break it out um, and we mark it with an up arrow so we know which way is up. And then we um, will go down and we have to collect continuous pieces because we can't miss anything because we start from the top and make our continuous sampling down and make a chronology that way. So here's when we get really far down into the, into the coral, we have to screw on all these long line extension rods. Um, this is our uh, drill bit here, this long one. And this is, uh, this is the core breaker right here and core catcher. So we have all these different tools. You can see one of the holes we made here. So when we're done, we, in this case, we, this is right after we finished drilling over here in November, 2011, we put in these cement plugs and the, what happens is the coral will grow laterally and heal over that surface. Here it was photographed in um, 2014, so three years later. And you can see that the holes, there was one, one evidence of a hole there that's healed over. And the two others are, you can't even see them. The coral is completely healed back over again. So we don't think we're hurting the corals too much. We're obviously not helping them, but we think they, they heal over. Um, and the, the climate archive inside the coral is just simply remarkable. 
So these are the three corals we collected from that one colony um, after six days of work in um, 2011. This is very similar to the, I'm gonna be talking about the corals in Panama, but we collected them the same exact way. So we get back to the lab, we, um, we have to cut the corals in half and we're gonna use a modified tile saw to do that. And we cut them a slab off of them about eight millimeters thick that we then x-ray and clean. And we mark them with a line because we wanna cut them along the same axis all the way from top to bottom. So we'll line them up, we'll mark them, cut them in half and cut a slab off. And then we'll x-ray that slab. This is actually the um, Secus Island coral. I'm gonna be showing you some data from it in a minute. This is from Panama. This was collected actually in 1984 by um, some colleagues of mine before I got working on this. This coral was collected in 1984 and extends back to approximately 1707 at the bottom. And you can see that it's not as nicely banded as the other corals I showed you, but it's got very clear bands in some intervals. Um, and more importantly, the bands banding is generally horizontal which means we can sample pretty carefully um, straight vert and vertical sample paths. So we use these little either handheld um, drills um, to drill out with a, a diamond cut bare ball on the end of it, or sometimes we use a micro mill depending on what we're, how we're sampling, but usually we do it by hand, every millimeter under a microscope. And we drill out these narrow sample paths um, marked every millimeter so we can we can go back into the coffee need to at a particular millimeter and resample we have to and we we sample if you look closely at this coral image which i blew up if you can see these vertical lines here those are the individual polyps growing vertically and you notice they're fanning away from a growth axis a middle point because corals reproduce in two ways, both sexually and asexually. They'll, they emit sperm and eggs into the water, but they'll also bud by dividing into, from one polyp into two, two into four, four into eight. So they'll have these growth axes. So, and we try, we've learned over time that we need to sample down the middle of the growth axis. So we'll follow down a growth axis. In this case, it bent here. And then we'll sample, we'll um, continue down parallel to the growth axis. And in this case, we had to jump across the slab and we pick a very clear boundary to do that. And then we sample continuing down. We call these track jumps. So we take these little samples, we put them into um, little micro centrifuge tubes. That's um, a coral powder. Now today I'm gonna to be talking about just two tracers that we measure, but there are several other types of tracers we could measure. We, we're going to be talking about the oxygen isotope values ratio in the coral aragonite and also the barium content are the two. And I don't have time to go into great detail about this, but this tracer oxygen isotopes is a function of temperature and salinity and a little bit of biological artifacts we always try to quantify. And it turns out that in some corals, not all, but some corals, particularly in Panama, barium is highly correlated to river discharge and sometimes nutrients, but in this case, highly related to river discharge. So this is again, something I would spend a couple of weeks talking about in a geochemistry class, but we're gonna be talking about, we, we measure the stable isotope ratios of oxygen and carbon, because what we're gonna do is dissolve our sample and generate carbon dioxide gas. So this is a little plot of neutron number versus proton number. If you've had chemistry in school, um, and this the, the main elements on here are, are highlighted in gray. And the point is that many elements have stable isotopes. Like for oxygen, 99% of all oxygen is oxygen 16, a mass of 16 total, eight protons and eight neutrons. But dominant form of nitrogen is nitrogen 14. Um, carbon, the main form of carbon is carbon 12, with six protons and six neutrons. If we add another neutron to carbon, we end up with carbon 13. If we add another proton to carbon, I know you can't answer this, but we actually get another element, right? We would make it heavier. Um, it'd become, it would become, um, be nit become nitrogen. So it turns out that we measure, um, oxygen has three isotopes and then oxygen 17 is a very rare isotope. So we measure the ratio of oxygen 18 to 16 and the measure of ratio of carbon 13 to 12 in our samples. 
And so coral aragonite is chemically cal calcium, carbon, and three oxygen atoms. And so what we're gonna do is dissolve this in a weak acid, phosphoric acid, and generate carbon dioxide gas. And when we start talking about barium, it turns out that metals can substitute for calcium in the nilata. So we, can, we find things in here like strontium and barium and magnesium, manganese, boron, uranium can fit in here sometimes. But so there's lots of different trace elements that can fit in there as well. So when we di digest this in a weak acid, we generate carbon dioxide gas. And the way these mass spectrometers work is we measure the different ratio of um, different types of carbon dioxide. So in this case, over here shows the natural abundance of oxygen isotopes. Um, oxygen 16 is 99.76% of all oxygen in, in the air you're breathing right now. Oxygen 18, two more neutrons, that's 0.2%. And there's a very minor amount of oxygen 17, which we actually correct for when we, when we make these measurements. So we digest our calcium carbonate, we generate carbon dioxide gas, and the dominant form that would be mass 44, which is carbon 12 and two oxygen 16s. If we have one carbon 13 atom in there, the mass becomes 45. If we have one oxygen 18 atom, the mass becomes 46. And we could end up with mass 47, but it's very rare to have two of the, uh, the heavier rare isotopes in the same molecule. So this would be a very minor um, element, minor um, compound. So we measure the ratio 46 to 44 to get our oxygen isotope ratio and then measure the 45, 44 ratio to get the carbon isotope ratio. And I'm not, not gonna talk carbon isotopes today. That's a whole nother series of um, classes that talk about that. But this ratio of oxygen 18 to 16 in the coral ragnar is a function of temperature and salinity. In the barium content, it turns out, the barium is gonna go up as salinity um, changes. So um, again, just to give you a little class and stabilize to nomenclature so you can know what we're gonna talk about. So we don't simply measure, since we're measuring ratios of 46 to 44 and 45 to 44, we have to make everything relative to a standard. So we stabilize to geochemists have developed this technique for in all the labs in the world use the same standards. We calculate what's called the um, Delta notation, this Greek letter D which is basically the ratio of your sample divided by the ratio of a standard minus one times a thousand. So everything's normalized to a universal standard. And all labs use the same standard. We also, we call this per mil. And this is another way of writing that formula. So we basically measure the oxygen isotope ratio in the sample, we subtract the isotope ratio in the standard divided by the same ratio in the standard times a thousand. And that's our Delta value. And so the way you think about this is that if del 18 is more negative, so if, if, the, if the isotope ratio of your standard equals your sample exactly, this equation becomes what? Becomes zero, because um, you're dividing, um, you can end up with zero. So everything's relative to zero. So if it's more negative, it's gonna have more of the light isotope. So it can be more negative. If it's more positive, it's gonna have more of the heavy isotope. So that's our delta notation. And this is, these are the pictures of the labs, of some of the equipment we use to make these measurements. I have two of the stabilized to mass spectrometers in our lab here at Lamont Doherty. Um, this is a, made by Thermo Fisher Scientific, and this one's made by uh, Elementar. I'm gonna show you a little bit about that. Just so you, these are not simply just black box numbers. So what we do is we ionize the gas, um, um, we dissolve the sample, and I'll show you that in a second. We generate purified CO2 gas that we're gonna put into an ion source here under high vacuum. We're gonna ionize the gas, which is gonna be a mixture of again 46, 45, and 44 masses of CO2, carbon dioxide. And we're gonna accelerate that down a flight tube under high vacuum through a magnet. So we're gonna fly, fly the carbon dioxide atoms through a magnetic field. And we're going, to then, we're going to separate them by mass because the heavier ones are going to deflect less than the lighter ones. So mass 46 would be over here, mass 45 and mass 44, which would deflect the most. And we have collectors over here ratioing 46 to 44 and 45 to 44. And that's where we get our oxygen isotope values. 
and it just turns out you can use the same instrument to measure um, carbon dioxide for carbon. You can also measure um, other isotopes the same way. So here's our view of our um, mass spectrometer system. This is the preparation system here on the left, and then the main mass spec is on the right. This is what it looks like inside that preparation system. Our acid is up here in a little doer. It's the whole thing's at 70 degrees centigrade. We're going to drip two or three drops of acid into these vials where the samples are under high vacuum, and we're going to evolve um, water and we're going to evolve carbon dioxide. It turns out the reaction generates water vapor and we have to get rid of it. So we freeze it out. If you notice, we have a big tank of liquid nitrogen here. And underneath this bench, we have a device that's freezing that water and purifying the carbon dioxide. So most of what you're seeing here is a method of purifying the carbon dioxide before we put it into the mass spectrometer. This is the other mass spectrometer, but it shows um, a little bit more about what's going on um, once you get the purified gas. So in this case, the, the gas, um, this is our acid reservoir here, our pump that pumps the acid into the samples. The, the CO2 gas goes into this, um, sorry, goes into this uh, stainless steel tube and runs through all these different plumbing. And all these devices here are designed to use liquid nitrogen to freeze out um, the water and purify the carbon dioxide. And these are called dual inlet mass spectrometers because right here on this bottom of this where it says swage lock is a tank of CO2, which is our reference gas. So remember we said we measure everything relative to a reference gas. So this is our reference gas. And it's called dual inlet because there's two sides, a sample side and a reference side. And then these, these are called bellows, which are used to balance the pressure, pressure in our reference gas. And this is the reference pressure in our sample gas. The gases go into the mass spec into this thing called the source. Here's the source I pulled out because we're replacing this thing called the filament. So you can see there's a lot of complicated machinery here and oftentimes things are broken. You have to fix, but this is the source which ionizes the gas and all these different magnetic plates or electric plates you can use to tune the sample gas to get the beam going into the magnetic field. So here's a, a, a looking up the mass spec. This is here's our magnet. This little skinny thing is the flight tube. The gas is flying under high vacuum through this flight tube, through the magnet, into our collectors, which are over here um, at the far end of the mass spec, mass spectrometer. So barium, so barium calcium, we measure that in a little different way. We're, it's not an isotope. We're going to measure the total barium, but we measure it relative to calcium, which is what's called the barium calcium ratio. And we do that with a lot of metals. We normalize them to the calcium content of the samples. So we, in this case, we use what's called an ICP OES, an inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometer. And this is a a device where we're going to take our samples and go to weigh them out. We weigh out um, 300 micrograms of sample. It goes into these little reaction tubes, it goes into this rack, and they're, they're, they're reacted with nit nitric acid. And the, the nitric acid gets sucked into the machine through this pump. And then it gets burned in an argon plasma. So inside of here, there's a, this is a blow up of when the plasma's on. And, you, and we burn the sample at a very high temperature. And it generates um, different elements, it turns out. Have, you'll study this when you study chemistry and physics, that the elements generate very specific spectral lines, light lines, when they burn. So this machine on top of here is designed to focus on specific um, spectral lines that you tune it to. In this case, we're tuning it to barium, strontium, magnesium, and calcium. And so we measure cal barium calcium ratios, strontium calcium ratios, magnesium calcium ratios using this um, ICP OES, and that's how we get our barium data. Now we're getting, now going back to the barium and the whole story of Panama. So it turns out that um, in many estuaries, and here's an example from a paper in 1997 by Coffey and others, that barium, um, this, the plot, these are plots of salinity of the ocean of the, in the estuaries, which is the salt content versus the barium concentration. And, um, nanomoles per liter. And it turns out if you look, there's a linear correspondence between barium, uh, barium declines as salinity goes up. And so barium increases as um, salinity is, um, 
as this gate. So um, as Barium goes, um, as we get into low, low salinity, um, Barium goes down. So this is all showing that this Barium correlates with salinity in a very con conservative way in a linear fashion. When salinities are greater than about 10 salinity units, above and the in the salinity in the gulf of cherokee is about 31 so we think the barium is a good tracer of salinity in this situation so this is our um, data from the top of this Secas island coral in panama on the far western side of panama um, so this couple things shown on here so the red dots are our barium data barium calcium is a uh, going, um, showing these peaks. And this is river discharge under uh, behind it. So river discharge in cubic meters per second. And there's a very strong annual cycle in the barium content, uh, which correlates remarkably well um, with uh, the river discharge. And so the correlation statistics are shown down here. And so again, this doesn't work in all corals, and all, but it works for some reason really well at this one site that barium is tightly correlated with river discharge with greater barium and correlating with higher river discharge. So we appears that we can, and this one coral, as I said, it was collected in 1984 and it goes back to the early 1700s. So the coral was out here in the middle of Secas Islands, the Secas Island group. And this is the coast of uh, the western side of Panama. And we went back in 2018 and collected four other coral cores down in this site, which we're also analyzing as part of this project. We're still in the middle of this and we've gotten delayed from the pandemic a little bit. But So what appears to be going on, and as we were there in Panama in March, at the end of the dry season, and one day, all of a sudden the water got really cloudy, um, full of all this particulates when there had been a rainstorm event. So it appears that all these rivers here will dump uh, lots of fresh water and particulates into the, into the Gulf during rain events. That picture was taken down in here, but that, that appears to be this um, signal carrier getting barium out to the, the coral site. So here's our plot now. We've taken that data and we've made annual averages of the barium calcium, which is these red dots from 84 back to 1958, and, and, and annual river discharge behind it. Uh, and then the green and the blue lines. And these red arrows mark um, times when the Panama Canal Authority put ship restrictions in place to implement um, because of droughts in the canal. So the, again, the canal's over here and we're, we're looking at the river discharge over in this bay, but a coral, the, the rainfall and river discharge correlates really well between this site and this site. So we think we can use this as a proxy for what's going on on the other side of Panama. And it turns out that these um, dry events correspond to El Nino activity. And I'm, I'm going to talk about El Nino in, in a second here. If you haven't heard of El Nino, um, it's a time when the Eastern Pacific gets anomalously warm. It happens every sort of three to nine years. Um, it was named after by a Peruvian fisherman who noticed that this showed up around Christmas time every so often. And when that happens, um, productivity diminishes and upwelling stops in the Galapagos Islands. And you hear about you know, sea lions and seals having food issues, and it generates strange hydrologic patterns in, in the atmosphere. In this case, in Panama, it gets normally dry in Panama during El, El Nino events. And it has these two phases, the warm phase is El Nino, the cold phase, the opposite phase, when it's enormously cold in the middle of the Pacific, is called La Nina. So El Nino and La Nina, they reoccur every three to seven years. There's some evidence that El Nino is becoming more active. So we'd like to generate some records of El Nino activity back before several hundred years to see if in fact that is true. So we're trying to hopefully use this Panama coral to look at El Nino activity in that way. And this um, highlights what's going on with rainfall in the Panama. And this is average January precipitation, which is the dry season in Panama. This is a, um, a map of the green areas are very wet. And we have the intertropical convergence zone and the South Pacific convergence zone. You can see this ITCZ band of rain goes all the way around the globe. 
And in the dry stages of Panama, you can see it's a little bit south of Panama and maybe a gap in it. So during El Nino conditions, this is what happens. The ICC is held south by the warm water in the Galapagos, Eastern Pacific area. And it, we get very dry conditions in Panama and the water gets a little warmer. So we should be able to use these two coral tracers, oxygen isotopes and barium to look at drought and relative warmth in Panama to get a, a handle on El Nino frequency. And that's what we're trying to do right now. I think this is a work in progress. We've already measured the oxygen isotopes on that coral. So here's our values in per mil. Um, again, relative to that standard, this is the DELO18 and per mil in the PDB standard. So these values are getting more negative upwards, which we'd interpret as um, warmer or wetter conditions because this trace is a function of both temperature and salinity rainfall river discharge. We've simply we've measured barium on this part of it um, so far or in this plot. And so I blow up that, this data down here. So the red dots are the barium, the uh, black open circles are the oxygen isotope data. So again, so the barium is increasing during times of river discharge, increased river discharge. And the oxygen isotopes is a function of river, or basically hydrology and temperature. So these years where there's a mismatch, like here, and so uh, this would be 1981, this is 83, this is uh, 1972. And anyway, so these years where there's mismatches, I would interpret this as times of warmth in the waters in the Gulf of Cherokee, Panama, and drought. So there's a drought, and that so that's exactly the conditions you get during El Nino. So then it turns out this is an El Nino event, 1982, 83, 1972, 73. There's other El Ninos in 76 that look, that do not result in so much warming in Panama. So it turns out there's different flavors of El Nino too. We're hoping to say something about that, but you can see there's a time maybe here of more El Nino activity back in the 1960s. So again, this is a work in progress, and we've actually pushed this barium calcium re record back now into the 1800s, and we're still analyzing this coral right now. So this is the raw data um, off the off the different machines, for, for the back to 1940 on the top and back to 1890 on the bottom. So this we have to do some more massaging the data at first, but you can see there are some intervals where there's these mismatches. I would interpret that this is then turns out to be this is a uh, two year El Nino event. But then before about 1920, um, these events, some of these are not documented. So we're hoping to use this as a El Nino record. Although again, this is a work in progress. And again, we pushed this back this far so far, but we have these this long oxygen isotope record. And if you look closely at this, you can see there's a, a very weak trend in both of these data sets towards um, lower oxygen isotope values, more negative values, and higher barium values in the later part of the 20th century, which might might be evidence of I'm sorry, might be evidence of a, a great increasing river discharge into the 20th century, so more rainfall. Um, and that trend is something else we're very curious about. So we have those other corals from uh, that we collected in 2018. We're gonna extend this record up from 1984 to 2018. Again, this is a work in progress. I have some students helping me on this and uh, we've been busy in the lab over the last year um, pushing this and we have some more work to do. So uh, thank you for listening. And now we can talk about any questions you have. Thank you, Brad. Um, so we'll quickly have Rosalba share some resources. Rosalba is from the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And um, after that, we'll open it up to questions. Should I stop sharing my screen? Yes, if Rosalba, you'd like to yeah. share your screen and present. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much. Let me, I threw some links in the chat and I also, I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. 
So hello everyone, my name is Rosalba and I help support NASA's Office of STEM Engagement at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And yeah, so I am happy to share about super quick about some supplemental resources to learn more about corals. So first, so yeah, I have three resources to share. So the first one is a NASA mission. So it's the coral website. Then there's also a citizen science project um, that is called NemoNet, and also there's the Climate Kids website. So coral, so NASA recently developed some very sensitive instruments to study coral reefs from an airplane flying above the ocean. So this mis mission named coral is stands for Coral Reef Airborne Laboratory. And so it uses an instrument called the Portable Remote Imaging Spectrometer or PRISM to see the condition of reefs. So scientists are going to be able to monitor the reefs and their health. They will be able to measure the amounts of coral, algae, and sand on the ocean floor. This mission covers the Mariana Islands, Palo portions of the Great Barrier Reef and the main Hawaiian islands. So you may find it interesting. Another cool thing with the, web, the website is that it has a series of videos, Earth Expeditions and Science Cast, and um, a lot of really cool information to learn more about corals in general. So I do highly suggest that you explore. It. And then the next resource is NemoNet. So this is a, pretty much a game that you can play on your iPad. And so you classify coral reefs and you can read the classifications of other players. But the cool thing is that you play, but you're also helping with classify and assess uh, global coral reefs. So your observations are going to be fed into NASA's first neural multimodal observation and training network. So again, you can have fun and at the same time help us assess the coral reefs. And then finally, there is this website called Climate Kids. So this is for younger audiences, but if there are any elementary school teachers or elementary school students, they may like this website. So there are games, there are um, interviews to scientists, there are oh, videos and activities. And so there's one specific section about corals. They actually explain the coral mission that I was telling you about before. And they also have a game about coral bleaching. So you may find that fun. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalba. Um, so it is 6.45. So we want to be respectful of your time for participants um, who have to go, but um, Brad, if you want to answer questions, I think there's one from Natalie in the chat, if you can view that. And for anyone else who has questions, please feel free um, to ask them before we wrap up. Which question? From Natalie, it says, can the solubility of barium differentiations between fresh and seawater be explained talking about equilibrium? Is it a simple ion availability or common ion effect? Very good question, Natalie. And actually, we I don't know the answer to that. We're, we're, we've noticed this really high chorus, correlation between barium calcium ratio in our coral and river discharge. So with more barium in the coral, corresponding to greater river discharge. But as I said, this doesn't work at other coral sites I've worked at, right? All the other sites I showed you, we've tried, we've measured barium before and it never correlates. It's, also been shown to correlate with river discharge in Australia, however. So different, different sites are different and we're not quite sure exactly what the signal carrier is um, in the Gulf of Cherokee. It may be the particulates in the water that are bringing, we think the barium is coming from the soils on land and being carried into the water. And so it's probably, I guess, not an equilibrium um, with, with the ocean water. So that's a, a sort of vague answer to your question. I apologize. That's something we're actually working on. So I'm happy to talk to you more about it if you want to contact me by email later. Okay, so if no one else has any questions, I guess we'll wrap it up.
Um, so thank you to everyone for joining us today. The recording should be posted on the website in the next week and we'll send it around to everyone who is registered um, along with materials and resources that we've mentioned. Thank you, Brad, for joining us today. Um, hopefully, it was fun. We'll, yeah, hopefully we'll see you all in the next session and have a great rest of your day. Be well, everybody. Thank you for coming.